Okay, so I'm going to go through this first module in fire alarms, fire detection alarm systems. Again, I'll go through the first module. Uh, the middle two are kind of uh, a lot of um, legislation and stuff, so I won't go through that and read it word for word. Again, you can read it on your own. I think it's pretty straightforward. And then I'll lecture on the last module as well, too, which is what we're going to do for our labs. So the first one's pretty good. It just it kind of just gets a basic introduction into fire alarm systems and the type of devices we have and that kind of thing. So we'll go through this. Again, I think it's fairly interesting, so it's it's not too terrible you know, information-wise to go through. It's pretty straightforward, but again, contains some in information that maybe you didn't realize um, you were using uh, if you've done fire alarm systems previous. So they talk about the four stages, the incipient stage, smoke stage, flame stage, and the high heat stage. Again, it depends on what type of detectors we have to be able to detect these stages. Um, again, the, of the four, smoke causes the most uh, deaths. Mainly it's basically changing the oxygen to smoke so you can't breathe and you um, will perish because of that before you even have to worry about burning. So that's that's an issue, and we need to get people out of this out of the area in these first stages so that we can reduce the loss of life. Um, in a basic fire alarm system, we have to have at least three components. <clears throat> so we're going to have the fire alarm control unit to provide logic for the processing system, and that's what's making the decisions when it sees a change in state from a field device. It's going to make a decision or have an action based on that. A manual pull station, so at least one way we can manually initiate an alarm. And then an audible signal device to alert all the occupants of a building they must evacuate. So if somebody does pull a manual station or a detector or another field device goes off, we have to be able to evacuate the area. Um, the conditions that a fire alarm system is going to be in, and if you've ever walked into a front entry of a building or been part of this as an electrician, You've probably seen it in trouble. Um, trouble is not an alarm condition. It's just basically sitting there and saying that something isn't right with the system. So the system is not potentially not fully operational. Under normal condition, it's powered, ready to receive, receive input signals from the field uh, detection devices. So the smoke detectors, heat detectors, any pole stations, any of that stuff, it's sitting there waiting for it to change state and then initiate an alarm sequence potentially or a trouble. A trouble condition is just an equipment failure or a fault. So it could be a broken wire, a loose wire has come off, a piece of uh, field equipment isn't working properly. You can get a trouble condition from that. It's basically an open in the circuit. Um, it could also fail and give you an alarm as well to a field device. So an alarm condition is the signaling device is activated to war and warn the occupants to, act to evacuate. So in an alarm condition, either the pull station has been pulled, the smoke detector has sensed smoke, the heat detector has sensed uh, an excessive heat, and now we're into an alarm condition where we're going to initiate the signaling devices, the bells, strobes, horns, that kind of stuff, to get people to evacuate. Under trouble condition, you won't have normally have the bells and strobes going um, because it's just a trouble and not necessarily a reason to evacuate. Uh, supervisor condition. Change the condition of a field device in an automatic sprinkler system that could prevent the proper operation of the system. So some things, uh, again, specifically for a sprinkler system, we have them basically they're supervised. So if somebody tampers with it, if it's a valve that needs to be open and somebody closes it, that's going to go into a supervisor condition and show that back at our um, control board here too. So we'll be able to see that. So it's giving you trouble. It would have this light on, alarm this light, and it would... Um, tell you again if it's zoned out which zone the issue is in. Uh, the two types that we're going to come across single stage uh, where basically an audible evacuation alarm signal so an alarm signal is sounded by sounded immediately by all, all signaling devices or appliances so if something goes off smoke detector pull station the alarm signal is going off instantly. The difference between the single stage and a two stage is in a two stage, we get an alert signal once something has gone into, um, into uh, an alarm stage. So if a manual pull station is activated, we give trained personnel time to respond to that and see if it is an actual fire or if it's like if it's in a hotel, if somebody's pulled the uh, 
pull station as a prank or something like that, somebody has time to go and check and see if it is a fire or um, and then if it is, they could either initiate the alarm or they can um, acknowledge the um, alert signal. So again, that's if somebody's trained to do that and has the key because it's a key switch that they would have to use at the pull station. So they'd have to know which pull station was pulled, go up there, initiate the key if it was um, not in a fire. If it, uh, again, if it's determined if there is no fire, the first stage can be acknowledged by a switch. Um, the first stage, if it is not acknowledged within five minutes, a timing circuit will initiate the second stage. So if you do not acknowledge that there is a fire or not within five minutes, um, it's just going to go into an alarm. So if you don't have somebody that's available to go up and address it, then it's going to go into an alarm and everybody's going to evacuate. Both the first stage and second stage must be designed so that the signals are audible throughout the building. If there are multiple zones, the evacuation alarm signal is sounded in the zone affected and the alert signal is sounded through the adjacent areas. So if we have a zoned out system, um, again, it would be designed as such if and there's an alarm in one zone, it may not be an alarm in every zone, but they'll alert in the zones that are close to it so that people know that there is a fire and potentially evacuate the building as well. Um, a two-stage system must also alert the fire department when the first stage operates. So it would probably be a direct call. As soon as that happens, it's going to call the fire department. Then the fire department will call the um, business and say, you know, hey, basically what is going on? Did you guys acknowledge that or is there an actual alarm? And uh, they would uh, potentially come in after that. Uh, fire alarm system features. So we have our control panel. Again, that's where everything is coming back to. That's our main unit. It's making um, decisions based on the inputs from our field devices. So it receives signals from those detection devices such as smoke detectors, heat detectors, pull stations, flow switches. And once triggered, it retains the alarm condition. So somebody would have to acknowledge that and change the state would have to be changed in the field device for it to go away. It transmits signals to signal appliances such as bells, horns, and strobes. So once there is a detection device that has initiated an alarm condition, um, specifically alarm condition to, to be able to actually um, turn on the signal appliance, that's where we get the strobes and horns and bells going off. Um, again, that would not happen in a trouble situation. It provides electrical supervision, monitors the integrity of circuits, equipment, emergency and AC and DC power, and provides visual and audible indication of trouble conditions. So again, if it's not an alarm, but there's a piece of equipment that's faulty, a wire has come off, um, somebody's tampered with something, this panel is also going to let us know that. So it's basically supervising the whole system all of the time. So it sends signals to the ancillary devices such as automatic doors, exhaust fans, door holders. Okay, so we can have other devices that potentially we want to lock doors, turn fans off, that kind of stuff can also be operated from the control panel. The CPU, basically think of it as like a CPU and the central processor in a computer. It's the brain of the fire alarm system and is situated on the control panel itself. Again, it responds to the changes from the field devices and then initiates um, other actions based on that. Uh, the emergency power supply, again, we have to have these, these have to be able to be working even if the event of a power failure. So it can be supplied from a generator, batteries, or a combination of both. You might have batteries that are just temporary and then generator kicks in to make sure that it's operational must be capable of being automatically and instantaneously transferred to supply the system. So again, if the power goes out, it just automatically switches over. We don't have to manually do any of that. Must provide electrical supervisory power for not less than 24 hours and have a minimum reserve capacity to provide full load power for five to two hours, depending on the building and occupancy classification. So again, it would depend on if you have people living there, residing there all the time. But again, supervisory power for not less than 24 hours and capacity for full load for five to two, depending. Okay, because once we're in, if we're in alarm condition, that's going to draw a lot more from our panel because then we have horns and strobes going off. Uh, the enunciator, you might have seen these uh, in most buildings that you've entered. Larger apartments, larger office buildings have um, obviously large enunciators. 
It's a visual indicator that announces or displays a signal from the fire alarm system. A separate enunciator must be located in each zone if there's a multi-zone system. Basically what it's going to do is going to tell you where the issue is. So if it's on level one, two, three in this example, which building it's in, which level it's in, and uh, it's going to give you an indication of where the issue has, has happened. So these would be little LED indicator lights on here that would show you. Um, they can be remote, so again not located right with the fire alarm control panel. If it is, um, it needs to be located either on the front or a remote location. If it's remote, it must be installed at the principal entrance that the fire department would respond to. So again, they can use it as an indication of where the issue is. It contains visual signals that light up uh, areas of map or geographical representation of the building. If it is separate, it will be supervised. Again, supervised meaning that if something happens to it and it's not operational, we need to know. So it will send a trouble signal back to the main control panel if there is an issue with the enunciator, if it's remote. Uh, voice communication system, a central alarm and control facility is, design, is a design location and billing used for command and control. It contains a fire alarm control components, signal device, and other life safety equipment such as voice communication system. Uh, the voice communication system consists of a two-way communication system and loudspeakers. So this is basically somewhere, I think of it as like a large office building where they have a, a central desk where it's everything is being controlled there. So the control panel would be there and there's somebody monitoring this. Okay, there's... Um, Sometimes they'll refer to it as a fire commander and they'll be responsible for running this and actually, you know, speaking over the loudspeakers to any zone, basically providing people with information and evacuation routes or relocation, depending on the issue. So you wouldn't see that in, a, in an apartment or anything like that. I mean, it's something that's monitored all the time by a person. Firefighter phone basically allows the fire commander to maintain contact with the fire department. Um, if they're on different floors, they could have a firefighter's phone, phone sorry, and it'll go right back to the main control area. It's basically so that they can reduce any of the garbled or unclear conversations from radio. So we have a direct line, again, as long as it's not compromised, back to the um, main, main command center. Okay, so an objective two, they start talking about manual pull stations. Again, they, it's part of our system. We have to have at least one manual pull station. And they are located at the principal entrance and any required exit. Again, required exit would be decided by the classification of each floor of the building. When a person discovers a fire, they can use a manual pull station to initiate a detection signal in the fire alarm control panel. So again, um, just pull it down basically closes this switch and provides an alternative path for current flow as opposed to the end of line resistor. So basically it shorts out the device and we get into an alarm condition as soon as that is pulled. We have also have a two stage pull station. So this is what we talked about between the single stage and two stage systems where we have a second key. So that's this guy right here or sometimes in the ones in our lab when you pull the pull station down the key is behind the uh, panel that you pull down. What it does is this first stage is going to basically get it into an alert signal. Then you have that maximum of five minutes to get up there, see if there is an actual fire, potentially acknowledge it with the key and that would be the second stage portion of it or um, initiate a, an alarm sequence at that point if there was an actual fire. Okay, so the two-stage manual pull station, this would be a wiring diagram for us. you easily recognizable as such. Automatic fire detectors, that's our heat, smoke, and flame. They tr transmit a signal to the fire alarm control panel. Again, they, there's different types of them. We'll talk about the heat first, then we'll talk about smoke and flame. So the thermal or heat, they're the cheapest ones. They have low false alarm rate. They're slow to respond, so that's a negative. Um, think if you have an extremely large area, it's gonna take a long time for the heat to get up to these detectors potentially. So it might already be um, a large fire by the time that's happening. Again, smoke is when in the first two stages, fire is in the third stage and already at this point we're causing damage. Um, 
best used for enclosed areas, again, where flaming fires to be expected. Otherwise, heat can be dissipated easily. So again, thing to watch out for. Operating temp should it be at least 20 to 25 degrees above the expected ambient temperature. Okay, again, that's gonna get us into a significant amount of heat. Three basic types of heat are fixed, temperature detectors, rate of rise and fixed, and rate anticipation. So the fixed, there's the fusible link, basically like a melting pot, like we've talked about for overloads, that kind of stuff. When the specific temperature is reached, it melts the alloy and it basically releases a spring that closes the contact. And then we have by metal, that cannot be reset though, sorry, the melting pot one, once it's done, you got to replace it. The bimetal uses uh, heat to expand a strip. Again, two dissimilar metals, they expand at different rates. So we get it to expand enough with enough heat and it will um, close a set of contacts as well. Those ones will reset once they're cooled down and potentially be reused. Um, the rate of rise and fixed temperature, these detectors have both fixed preset temperature element and a rate of rise. There's a small chamber with a diaphragm. A hole lets air escape through as the diaphragm expands and contracts due to normal temperature changes, but a rapid increase in temperature or a rapid rise causes the diaphragm to expand faster and the, then the air can escape and then that uh, closes the set of contacts as well. So again, that not a maximum temperature setting, but if it just increases too fast in any section, we could have an alarm scenario. Uh, rate of anticipation detectors, have both the features, but a rapid increase in temperature will initiate an alarm condition at one to three degrees ahead of the preset temperature. So that's the anticipation part. So it can see that it's rising, 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 and then, you know, three degrees ahead of the preset temp, it's gonna go into an alarm. Smoke detectors, uh, they detect the earliest stages. They're more expensive. They obviously, they respond faster and they're better for large open spaces. The two types of uh, smoke detectors we're going to talk about are ionization and photoelectric. So the ionization, they have a radiation source that converts air molecules into positive and negative ions. The negative move to the positive plate and the positive move to the negative plate. This completes a path of electricity. So it's like current flow. When smoke enters the smoke chamber, the particles attached to the ions disrupting the current flow. So now we have smoke particles attached to the ions and we don't have the uh, flow of electricity like we did previous. So when the flow of current is reduced, an alarm condition is initiated. So here's our radioactive, so radioactive source. When there's clean air, we got basically have electron flow. When we have smoke, the particles are gonna attach these and we're not gonna see flow through there and that will initiate a uh, alarm condition. The photoelectric, they talk about two types. The first one is light scattering. So it has overlapping covers to prevent the entrance of light, but allows the entry of smoke. So that's kind of like this maze here where we have openings in here. So no light can get in because this is a photocell, which is light sensitive, but we can get smoke through here still. So what happens is we have a light source that has a barrier and under normal conditions, no light is hitting this photocell. When we get smoke in here, the smoke particles actually start to deflect the light and start to hit the photocell, which is um, initiates the alarm condition. So that's where the scattering, so the particles scatter the light and some strikes the photocell. So it responds well to slow burning and smoldering fires. The light obscuring principle for photoelectric is the most common one. It projects a light beam like a laser pointer. Okay, so we just basically have a light source and a receiver and it's, it's happy when it can see those beams coming through. As soon as we get smoke in there, it obscures or blocks them. So that's the light obscuring principle. And then when we see a de decreased amount of light to the receiver, it will initiate an alarm. So flame detectors. These are different. So that was heat, smoke, now flame. So this would be like a fire eye. Um, flame detectors, they're extremely fast in response. They sense different types of electromagnetic waves. Also sense the modulated flicker of a flame, which must be sustained for a time. Sensitivity is a function of the distance from the fire and the size of the flame. So obviously the closer these are to the flame, they, they work way better. They are a line of sight device such as a fire eye blocking them, renders them useless. Okay, so I've hooked up fire eyes before. Uh, we had remote ones too. They would be pointed directly at a potential ignition source uh, or an area where a flame could be expected to be an issue. 
Uh, the two types are the infrared and the ultraviolet. Infrared is suited for fur fueled by burning gas, fuel, oil, naphtha, or wood. They can detect infrared radiation from glowing embers, have built-in filters, so only flickering rays will initiate an alarm condition. Okay, so our infrared is going to get our burning wood, uh, basically. Our ultraviolet, they're particularly sensitive to flames from burning gasoline, also sensitive to other UV emissions such as welding, mercury, or vapor, or lamps. So we wouldn't want those ultraviolet ones in a welding shop because they'd be going off all the time. And they will not respond to glowing ambers. Okay, so we definitely need um, to have uh, ultraviolet in certain areas and infrared in others. So here's a picture of an ultraviolet fire eye for a hazardous location, so it's that's why it's all enclosed. And it would be pointed right at the potential flame source. Uh, the audible signaling devices, these include horns, buzzers, uh, electronic signals, and speakers. Again, once there's been an issue detected by a smoke detector, heat detector, fire eye, pole station, we need to know, everybody that's in the building needs to know, and that's where the audible signaling devices come in. Okay, so they will let you know that there is an issue. Potentially, speaker, um, I've seen a trouble scenario where just, be, or on a two stage, I think it was, it was on the first stage that the strobe went off, but the horn did not. So that would be the alert portion where just the strobes were going off. So I was in a movie theater and it was right at the end of the show and I saw the strobe start going off in the theater and no siren. So it was kind of kind of cool to see that nobody moved. We kind of just finished watching, the movie was almost over. So we kind of finished watching the movie and we all got out. When we got into the main area, we noticed that there was smoke. And what happened was there was just a, a bit of smoke from uh, burning popcorn. So it set off the smoke detector. It was a two-stage system, so it went into an alert. Somebody went to the panel, acknowledged it, saying, hey, I know this is just popcorn burning. And it still was an alert, though. So everybody in the theater could still see those strobing lights, but it didn't go into an alarm condition because it was acknowledged previous. In that example, I assume they would also have, would have had to contact the fire department and let them know that it wasn't an actual fire and that they were just burning popcorn. Okay, so just an example. Um, one other thing they talk about is the ancillary equipment. So we talked about that before from the control panel. We can have other things that shut down or turn on if there is an issue in a certain area. HVAC control uses an auxiliary contact to involve operations, excuse me, during alarm condition. So we can turn supply, supply fans off, dampers controlling airflow can be closed. Um, exhaust fans can be turned on to remove smoke and stairwell pressure, pressurization can be maintained to prevent smoke from accumulating to assist in evacuation. So we can have all these things with the HVAC be tied into the system as well too. Um, the door release or door unlock during an alarm condition, door release or door hold open devices allow the doors to close and limit the fire um, to the smoke area to one area. So we have these in the college where we have door magnets holding the doors open. As soon as there's a fire alarm, the magnets turn off and all the doors shut. Uh, door unlocks allow occupants to evacuate through exits that are normally locked by electrical locking mechanism. So you could have a fire door that's only used as a fire exit and it would be locked until there's a fire alarm, then the door would automatically unlock. Elevator homing, this overrides the elevator control and automatically returns the elevator to the ground floor where they are held if the ground floor has the alarm condition and is not adequately protected by an automatic sprinkler system, it will send the elevator to an alternate floor. So if you're trying to use an elevator in a fire situation, it will not work. It's going to go to back to the main floor and it's going to stay there. So that's why you have to use the stairs. If you're in the elevator, you're going to be in luck because it's going right to the main floor anyways. Again, as long as there's not an alarm condition there, if there is, it'll go to an alternate one. Um, they have agent release also that could be part of the auxiliary or ancillary devices where um, it actually releases a um, fire suppression chemical or um, agent into an area. So it could be, hey, there's an alarm instantly. We, um, it, especially where there's fuel, that kind of stuff, that's where we want to have this to actually kind of limit that um, danger. Uh, automatic sprinkler systems, the four types, we have wet pipe. So it contains water under pressure. Closed sprinkler heads hold the pressure until the fusible link melts, allowing the water to flow through the heads. A school will have this type. Okay, so this is what we're used to saying. 
on a movie even somebody you know puts a lighter up to a sprinkler head and then water starts spraying everywhere instantly uh, the dry pipe it contains air under pressure so the fusible length opens and changes the change in air pressure opens a water valve allowing water to flow this would be found in a building that has uh, that is not heated and subject to freezing conditions so if we have a building that's not heated we obviously don't want water sitting in the in the lines because it would just freeze so they have air in those lines instead once the air pressure changes it opens a valve and then water goes through a pre-action sprinkler again this may or may not be pressurized depends on the activation from the detection devices such as a fire detector an alarm condition activates a solenoid that sends water or fire retardant into the dry pipe system. There's no delay in regards to waiting for the fusible link to melt. So once the initiate uh, the alarm situation is initiated, so even if a pull station, it's not worrying about or not waiting for that fusible link to melt. It's just going to start because there's an alarm condition. So they're found in high technology areas such as computer rooms. Again, worth time is of the essence. We don't. If uh, computer equipment sees fire, it's obviously destroyed almost instantly. The deluge system also controls by the fire alarm system and depends on the activation of an automatic detection device such as detector. So these two we we're just talking about again, not waiting for that fusible link to melt, but actually just an initiating device. Purpose of the deluge system is to totally flood a location where the fire hazard is very high, such as an aircraft hangar. Again, airplane fuel, that kind of stuff. We want to get that uh, taken care of quickly. Last thing we're going to talk about are smoke alarms. So different than a smoke detector, a smoke alarm is actually a detector and an alarm in all in itself. So this is for a residential application where we don't have a control panel. This is self-contained that combines, again, a smoke detector and the audible alarm, both in one device. So they shall be installed in each story, including the basement of a dwelling unit, more precisely from Rule 32-110 from the CEC, each bedroom or within 5 meters of the outside of a bedroom and no more than 15 meters from any point of the same floor level, on or near a ceiling to increase the probability of actuation at the earliest time. So in a vault we put these in. Permanent connection to electrical circuit that contains lighting loads hardwired in with no switch all tied together. So all the smokies or smoke alarms are tied together. If one alarms, they all alarm. Um, they also, again, cannot be turned off by a homeowner, so they have to have constant power. And we usually would put them on lighting loads so that we know if the breaker is not working, we would know instantly because the lights aren't on and we would know then also the smoke detector is not on and working. If you put it on with plugs, potentially the plug um, would not be working and you wouldn't realize. So yeah, we put them on lighting loads. Um, if there is an expansion to the dwelling, the new ones can be independent of the existing. So if it's not feasible for you to be able to hook it up to the existing, you can have a separate um, um, independent smoke alarm in that new area. So here's the connections. Again, we have 120 volts. This is again, usually for a residential application. So we have, there's our bond. We have our power and our identified coming in. And then the red wire is the interconnecting of all the devices. So it's the signal wire is what we call. So if this alarm, smoke alarm signals, it's gonna travel on this red wire and this guy's powered up from his 120. Now he has a signal, um, a power coming on signal wire and it's gonna alarm as well too. Okay, so if you got one going off upstairs, it should be going off downstairs as well. Okay, so that's kind of the introduction to smoke, um, smoke detection, heat detection, photo eye, uh, the way our panels work, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's, again, in interesting stuff, potentially stuff you've dealt with before, um, but a good introduction into fire alarms. And again, read through the next two modules, and I'll make a lecture for the last one.